Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. We are watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. It's a methodical, very difficult process. You know, as we're removing debris, we're just finding more debris that's just concrete pulverized. You know, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. Day six of the daunting search and rescue in Surfside, Florida, plus details of a letter that warned about growing damage in the condo building just two months ago. President Biden heading to Surfside, Florida on Thursday, but today he's in Wisconsin taking his infrastructure pitch to the people. America has always been propelled into the future by landmark national investments, investments that only the government has the capacity to make. Plus, it's getting hot in here, dangerous, record-breaking heat stretching from coast to coast. Is there any relief in sight? We start this hour with the sixth day of searching for survivors in the Florida condo complex. Two days before the beachfront condo collapsed, the Miami Herald reporting a pool contractor photographed these images of damage he saw in the basement level garage. Sarah Blasco with the Miami Herald wrote that story. Uh, Sarah, these photos do not look good. Cracked concrete, corroded rebar. Uh, you're not saying who shared these pictures uh, with you, but what can you tell us? What I can tell you is I spoke to this pool contractor directly yesterday, and what he told me is that he was alarmed enough by what he saw, and then once he saw the news, he thought he needed to come forward. Now, of course, there's a lot of national attention. He, he doesn't want the press, and that, that's why he does not want to come forward with his name, but he thought what he saw was serious enough that people should know, and let me point you to one part. Over those boxes, the gray boxes on the image, you will see a black cross. That's actually mm -hmm. rebar. That's supposed to be inside the concrete. What you're seeing there is that it oh, has wow. busted through the concrete. It is that corroded. This is a serious level of corrosion that um, our experts say, if it were under the building, it could have caused a collapse. Now, I just want to be clear with your viewers that this part of the building that is photographed here is not under the collapse site. It is off to the southern side of the structure. But if this okay. type of corrosion had existed somewhere else in the building, then or or beneath it, I should say, in the garage underneath the building, then certainly our experts say this level of corrosion is alarming. And even still here, it indicates a lack of maintenance in this building that is concerning. Yeah, sure raises a lot of questions uh, about the condition of the building. No question. Uh, Sarah, what did this contractor tell you about the restoration plans uh, for the condo? What, what else have you learned? So this contractor was actually there to bid for a subcontract in the 40-year restoration plan. His job was going to be basically cosmetic uh, things on the pool and replacing the pool equipment. And so what, what he was there for was different than what he saw. And actually, it, what he saw alarmed him enough. He thought his job was going to be harder. Again, he was just doing a tiny piece of this broader uh, plan, which was going to shore up different columns in the building. It was going to replace certain concrete slabs that an inspector had said had severe levels of damage to them. These are structural slabs in the basement of the building, rebar popping out of various columns in the basement of the building. This 40-year plan was going to be $16 million of renovation. And so this pool contractor was just bidding for a tiny bit. And that's why we only have these few photos, is he took photos of what might affect his job. And when he saw that rebar, he thought, oh, I have to tell my boss this might be a more expensive job than we originally thought. We might have to do more to give access to that concrete so that concrete restoration teams can go in and fix it. All right, Sarah, I know we've said this already. Uh, we don't know the cause here. And, and uh, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but let's go back again to what you're hearing from some engineering experts here. I mean, and what you've shared with us already, but just to reinforce here, uh, this just looks like serious, serious corrosion, serious structural concerns uh, that, that needed immediate attention a long time ago. 
Right. So I think the most important document that we have right now is a 2018 report Mm -hmm. by an engineer who came into the building and did an inspection. And what he said is that he found a design error in the pool deck, which is actually off to the side of the of the corrosion of these photos that you're looking at now. And and he said because of the way that it Mm -hmm. was designed, water did not drain properly and instead seeped into the concrete below into the garage, which is under the entire building, the part of the building that collapsed, that part of the garage had serious damage to some of the structural concrete, according to this 2018 plan. And I think the most important thing to note here is that this engineer said it needed to be fixed soon um, because this type of damage, this corrosion, once it's there, once that rebar is exposed, it can get worse very quickly. And then I will point you to a USA Today report from last Mm -hmm. night that broke the news of an update letter to that report which came in um, earlier this year in 2021, April. And, and what it said is indeed that damage got worse. It did not include photos. We don't know exactly where that damage is, but that's what everyone is focused on now because if there was this kind of corrosion, for example, in a column, experts tell us, or even in a, uh, a slab, experts tell us that certainly mm-hmm. could have collapsed under the weight of a building. But again, we just don't know at this point. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, uh, our reporters uh, on the ground are hearing from residents, some of them saying that they're really upset with the condo association because they feel like they did not maintain this building properly. What is the condo association saying about these photos and your reporting? What kind of response have you gotten so far? They did not respond to us directly, but what we've heard in other media appearances from the attorneys who uh, represent the condo association is that what they're saying is the price tag on this renovation was so high. Again, $16 million. That came out to almost $100,000 per resident, uh, I believe. That's a big bill to get landed with. And so what the condo association lawyer is yeah. saying is that the residents didn't want to move forward with this restoration. There wasn't enough in reserves. They had to secure a loan and that this caused tension. And what you can see again in that letter from April of this year um, from the condo association is that it, it's responding to comments that we don't know yet. But it, basically what it says is that we know that there has been a lot of discussion about this that there are concerns that we're, you know, over analyzing or under analyzing. Um, and, and, and basically what it indicates is that there had been a lot of disagreement about what to do with the report that it was initiated in 2018 and then updated in 2021. Sarah, there are so many questions about what happened here. Uh, I know you've been really working hard on that. Thank you so much for your reporting uh, and taking time when you're so busy to come on and talk to us. We're really grateful for it. Thanks for having me. These are the 11 victims identified in the condo collapse. 150 people still missing. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber is at the scene in Surfside. Ellison, what's the latest on the search and rescue mission tonight? Yeah, I mean, it, it's ongoing. The presser earlier today, there wasn't any bad news. There wasn't any news of another body being recovered, which is what we've gotten from the last couple press conferences. But there also wasn't any good news. The news that so many people are hoping for, praying for, that they'd found someone alive in the rubble. 11 lives lost, 150 people still unaccounted for. The weather here has been an ongoing challenge for rescuers. It has rained kind of really since this happened. And throughout the day today, there have just been moments of incredibly heavy down or thunderstorms, all of that adding to what is already a really challenging endeavor for these rescuers. Rescuers are working 12-hour shifts, and when there's a shift change, you can see them walk off just drenched in sweat, exhausted from all that the work, all of the work that they are doing, and then another group goes back on, surely just as tired from not long before working a 12-hour shift of their own. There are rescuers, of course, from Miami working every minute of every day. There are also teams that have come here from Mexico and Israel. I spoke to the commander of the Israeli search team, and he says right now they're sort of focused on a particular part of these apartments, at least as best they can. Listen to what he told me. Right now, our challenge 
is to reach the bedrooms. And there is a problem because the bedrooms collapse, the, the building collapses into itself and covers the bedrooms. So right now this is the effort and, and we still have hope. And when I asked the commander if he still has hope on day six that they might find someone alive clinging to life underneath the rubble, he said that he does still have hope. Uh, I want to read to you exactly what he told me when I asked him why. He said this, quote, each day that passes reduces chances. But I would say that one week, one week again, is a good time to say that we have made all efforts needed to find them alive. One week, that's seven days. We're on day six right now. Families are still holding on to hope as much as they can, but as every minute passes and there isn't any sort of good news, it's hard to not see some sort of big bad news coming down the way. But for now, rescuers are working yeah. as hard as they can, leaving no stone unturned. And they keep telling us that they really do think they can still maybe find someone alive. But you've got to think these next 24 hours, give or take, are really critical based on yeah. what we heard from the commander of the Israeli search team. Allison. Allison, I can't imagine what it's like to be one of those family members right now perhaps knowing deep down inside that bad news is on the way, but wanting so, so deeply to remain hopeful, uh, to have faith that they could get some good news, not wanting to give up. I, I know you spoke with a father uh, who was waiting for news about his daughter and son-in-law. I, I, it makes me want to cry just thinking about that conversation. Uh, what did he tell you today? Yeah, we met uh, Pablo Langesfeld and his son, Martin, there daughter and sister, Nicole. She was at home Thursday night in her condo on the eighth floor with her husband, Louis Sadovnik, and they were home with their pets. They loved animals and they've been missing ever since. They talked to us about what it means to try and kind of just hold on to hope. They are convinced that if anyone could fight, if anyone is still alive, that Nicole, their sister, uh, that she is a fighter, or Martin's sister rather, that she is a fighter and that they are praying that they're still there fighting. Let me, list, let, me let you listen to some of what we heard. This is uh, Martin, who is Nicole Langsfeld, uh, her brother. Listen here. They had, they have so much to look forward to. They were just starting off their lives, lives together. They had a plan for a family, some things that now, are unknown and for six days to go by and not knowing if they're in there if they're fighting why things like this happen it gets to you physically and emotionally and That won't change until I'm told otherwise. I do believe miracles do happen, and I know I know there's people and they're fighting. And I pray that my sister and my brother-in-law are one of those fighting. Nicole, her friends and family call her Nikki, and Louise actually just got married. They got married in January because of the pandemic. They just did a small little ceremony and got married at a courthouse. But her dad and her brother say that they were planning to have the bigger wedding, the bigger celebration with all of their friends after the pandemic ended. Instead of celebrating, planning for this very joyous life moment, they are now just praying for a miracle. They visited the site a couple times now, and, and Martin just told his sister that if she could hear him to keep fighting. Allison. Oh, Ellison, a couple starting uh, their life. Uh, you know what a beautiful time that is. I know what a beautiful time that is. It just breaks your heart to think that that might, that might have been the end for them. Thank you so much for your reporting today. You got me again. You make me cry all the time. Um, I, I know it's so difficult for you out there talking to these families and doing this hard work every day. So thank you so much. major heat wave scorching the U.S., parts of the Pacific Northwest dealing with temperatures 30 to 40 degrees above average. The Northeast also feeling the extreme heat and humidity. Let's bring in NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson, 
who is in a sweltering Manhattan tonight. Priscilla, this is the hottest it's been in New York City this year. Uh, you look like you're handling it pretty well. As a New Yorker, I can attest that weather like this guarantees two things. You're seeing a lot of sweating and a lot of cursing on those streets. Allison, uh, definitely that. As a Texan, I'm pretty used to the heat, uh, but folks out here are. It's a little <laughs> bit of a challenge, it seems to be. Uh, the streets are still pretty busy, but if you we widen our shot a little bit, you'll see this area near the fountain that is normally full of people during the summer is not as crowded as it normally would be. I will say folks are taking advantage of the ice cream trucks that are out and about. They're sitting down for a few minutes, and then they are uh, moving it along because it is very hot out here. It's about 93 degrees right now. Earlier, it was 95 degrees and sunny. We've got some clouds that have come in, so I think that has helped out a bit. But guess what? Tomorrow is expected to be even warmer. Uh, New York City and the entire tri-state area under a heat advisory until 8 p.m. on Wednesday, at which point we may see some rain start to move in, which could help to cool things off just in time for the holiday weekend. Allison? All right, Priscilla, now that I know that you're from Texas, this explains it because we're coming out to you and I'm thinking, oh, my God, she's not even schwitzing. She looks so composed. You know how to deal with this. Uh, but it, listen, it's not just there in New York, right? Millions of people from Delaware to Maine under heat emergencies. And we laugh about the heat, but I mean, it can really be dangerous. What's the plan to keep people safe uh, in this scorching weather? Absolutely, Allison. That is a really big part of it. It's why we're seeing cooling centers that have opened up across uh, all five bureau, boroughs of New York, uh, but also in Philadelphia. There have been cooling centers opened and even buses being used as cooling stations where folks can hop on and hop off to get a bit of relief. In Boston, they have actually declared an air quality issue in addition to heat advisories because this heat and humidity can really have an impact on folks who are sensitive to those issues. And to take it even further up north, Acadia National Park telling folks not to go to the park, to stay inside. Park rangers responded to a number of heat-related calls yesterday, and they are trying to avoid that. And that is messaging that we're hearing from folks across the board. If you don't have to be outside, try to keep it inside. And if you are outside, definitely drink that water and lather on the sunscreen uh, because it is hot out here. Allison? Yeah, keep it inside if you can, unless you're Priscilla Thompson, who can handle all sorts of weather. Uh, you impress me, my friend. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. Now to the Northwest, where a life-threatening heat wave is shattering records. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas is in Portland, Oregon, where it hit 116 this week. Millions across the Pacific Northwest struggling to find relief from the heat. It's unbelievable. We've been in Portland for over 20 years and we haven't experienced anything like this. Records, some more than a century old, shattering as temperatures soar 30 degrees above average from Oregon to Washington. This TikTok video showing toiletries at almost 100 degrees. In parts of Portland, some public transportation services shutting down Monday. The city streetcar system tweeting photos of power cable damage during the heat riding. In case you're wondering why we're canceling services for the day, here's what the heat is doing to our power cables. At the Oregon Zoo, a family of elephants keeping cool, splashing around in a swimming pool. Further south in Salem, temperatures soaring to a record high 117. And in Seattle, three consecutive days of triple digit temperatures for the first time on record. Today we couldn't get any ice. Everything is completely gone. So we're just coming to the water just to try to stay cool. Heat so high, Amazon turning a company headquarters building into a public cooling center. To North Washington, Interstate 5 shutting down lanes with buckled pavement. Fueling these scorching conditions, what's called a heat dome, a ridge of high pressure acting as a lid, trapping hot air and sending temperatures climbing rapidly, leaving the Northwest facing that extreme heat. It is time to check in with Simone. She's got the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. What's happening? 
Hey, Allison. Well, we start with this. U.S. home prices soaring at the fastest pace since 2005. Now, that's according to the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller Home Price Index that shows numbers increased by nearly 15 percent in April from the previous year. Economists say prices won't cool off anytime soon. And Maricopa County is replacing its old voting machines with new ones. The move comes after Arizona Republicans subpoenaed nearly 400 of the machines for an audit of the 2020 election results. County officials say they used backup equipment in municipal elections this year, but would use the new machines for its November elections. And in Abu Dhabi, anyone who is not vaccinated against COVID will be denied entry to nearly all public spaces. Now, the restrictions will begin on August 20th, but will not apply to essential businesses like pharmacies and supermarkets. Also important to note that children under the age of 15 and adults with exemptions to the vaccine will be given a pass here. And Brazil's president is sending troops into the Amazon to crack down on illegal logging operations there. The move comes as the country is seeing a surge in deforestation. And it's the third time the Brazilian president has sent troops to the Amazon for this reason. And a really fun story to end on today. A 70-year-old Connecticut woman living out one of her lifelong dreams at Yankee Stadium when she served as an honorary Batgirl. Now, Gwen Goldman said she asked the Yankees if she could be a Batgirl 60 years ago, but she was told she had no place in the dugout because of her gender. Well, finally, the team said it was time to make it right, greeting Goldman with a personalized locker and also giving her a chance to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. Got to love that one, Allison. I'll send it back to you. Oh, yeah. What you're looking at there is me in 30 years. That's my dream. Oh, my God. That's so awesome. Simone. <laughs> Thank you. A blue collar blueprint to rebuild America. President Biden taking his infrastructure message to Wisconsin today. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece is on the North Lawn. So Shannon, the White House says this trip is about bringing President Biden's message right to the American people. So what is he saying to them about the benefits of this bipartisan plan? Well, it's trying to get into some of the specific details of it and make it a little bit more tangible for what it would mean for real people's lives. For example, he's emphasizing things like bringing broadband to rural areas, uh, fixing a bridge that might be the only bridge that leads into town or replacing lead pipes in the millions of homes uh, that that could affect. Here's a little bit more, Allison, of what he had to say. This is a generational investment, a generational investment to modernize our infrastructure, creating millions of good paying jobs. The human infrastructure is intertwined with our physical infrastructure. It's going to help us create more good jobs, ease the burden of working families and strengthen our economy in the long run. And I'm going out and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be out there making the case for the American people until this job is done, until we bring this bipartisan deal home. And you hear him there mentioning bipartisan. That's another part of the selling campaign he's trying to do out there to emphasize that this is a bipartisan deal because, of course, unity is this message we have heard from him over and over again since his inauguration. And so the president and his administration trying to show uh, that they are delivering on that unity bipartisan nature that they promised. All right. So that's how they're using this trip to connect with the American people. How are they using it to put pressure on Congress to get this done? Well, uh, yes, of course, all of these uh, public campaigns and road trips are about building support with the public in hopes that that will translate into support on members of Congress, because it is really unclear at this point, despite being able to get 10 Republican and Democratic senators together on this, whether they're going to have the 60 votes that would be needed to get this through the regular legislative process in the Senate. Uh, and that includes whether or not they're going to have enough Republicans as well as Democratic support. So the president acknowledging that he needs to get out there, make this sales pitch in the White House, knowing that this is going to be something that's going to take place over the course of the summer. No expectations that they're going to mm -hmm. have an instant deal on this in the coming weeks. We're looking more like months. OK. Shannon, the White House announcing that the president and the first lady are heading to Surfside, Florida on Thursday, of course, to visit the condo collapse. What are you learning about that trip? 
All right. Well, the White House has said repeatedly that they didn't want to go here uh, until they felt they could do it without interfering with the search and rescue operations. Obviously, a presidential visit comes with a big footprint. Uh, you know, we know the White House has emphasized that they are putting a lot of resources on the ground to try and help in this recovery, but also that they would like to see some sort of federal investigation into what happened here. And of course, as the president has been emphasizing, infrastructure, our country's infrastructure is something that is really uh, central to what he wants to accomplish uh, as part of his first term as president. Shannon, you also have some new reporting on the White House's 4th of July push to declare independence, if you will, from COVID-19. Uh, so what are the big holiday plans and, and how do they tie into that messaging? Yeah, they're really using this holiday to uh, mark and tout the uh, achievements the country has made when it has come to vaccination and to tout these record low case numbers that we are seeing. There's going to be a large event at the White House. The National Mall will be back to the fireworks celebration as usual, as we have seen in the past years with no COVID restrictions being enforced. And we're also seeing the president on Saturday, or we will see him travel to Michigan to a tourist location to help promote tourism and the return of that state's economy. So really using this as a mile marker uh, to acknowledge how much they have achieved, of course, <clears throat> Officials say there is more room to grow, but um, certainly a moment of celebration the White House is hoping for. All right, Shannon Pettypiece on the North Lawn. Great to see you. A small syringe maker in Texas buying back stock. Why should you care, you ask? Because this was a tiny company until it won a multi-million dollar COVID contract from HHS last year and qualified for a PPP loan. So how does all of that add up? NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen here to discuss this one. All right, John, let's start with what's going on right now. Retractable Technologies filing a stock buyback with the SEC, and they're also announcing a dividend payment. Could you explain this for our viewers who might not be quite as stock savvy as a gentleman such as yourself? Uh, it's fairly complicated, but ultimately what it means is uh, shareholders will benefit in one of two ways, either uh, they will end up getting paid for their stock um, or, uh, number two, consolidating uh, their shares because there will be fewer shares. The ones that they hold uh, will then be a, a larger share of the company. There is one uh, major stockholder, one primary stockholder in the company who is the CEO. So, John, take us back a year. A year ago tomorrow, June 30th, 2020, you and Steph Rule wrote this piece on NBCNews.com. COVID-19 helped this small syringe business boom. Then came the taxpayer-backed windfall. I repeat for our viewers, taxpayer-backed windfall. What happened here? Right. First, the company was struggling and it needed a PPP loan to stay afloat. Uh, ultimately, that loan was forgiven. Uh, shortly thereafter, they got a contract worth $83 million from the federal government to make syringes. Obviously, there was a huge need. Uh, for syringes, there were other companies, much larger sort of household name companies uh, that were available to produce uh, needles and syringes. But this small company um, got this $83 million contract. It was raised to $93 million. And then uh, shortly before the Trump administration left office, work uh, went on to start a second contract. They got another, I think, 50 or $60 million. Um, and ultimately, what ended up happening is the stock of this company went from uh, about a dollar and a quarter a share to where it is now over eleven dollars a share. So if you had shares in that company, and again, the CEO was the main stockholder, uh, you were uh, you were sitting on a whole lot more money than you were before. Well, certainly a whole lot of value, a whole lot yes. more value. Yes. Yes, a lot of value, a lot of cash there, uh, John. Always great to see you, my friend. And I'm feeling this what looks like to me like the new summer hair. It's it's a good look. <laughs> My wife wants me to get it cut, but thank you. I appreciate the, uh, the vote of confidence, and I will take it up. It's summer. Let your hair down. My husband needs a haircut, too. <laughs> <laughs> China escalating its media crackdown in Hong Kong, arresting another prominent journalist from a pro-democracy paper under its national security law. NBC News senior foreign correspondent Keir Simmons has the details. 
Hey, Alison, Hong Kong has become a key test of President Biden's election promise to defend democracy around the world and of his China policy. Last week, President Biden released this powerful statement condemning the closure of a newspaper in Hong Kong. China responded equally powerfully, and now another journalist has been arrested. New developments in a crackdown by China the US is watching closely. Last weekend, Feng Wei Kong was apprehended at Hong Kong airport as he tried to leave the city and driven away. He was a leading writer for a pro-democracy newspaper, the Apple Daily. China's strong-arm tactics have seen a number of journalists at the paper led away in handcuffs. The paper forced to shut down. Applause in the newsroom last week as it printed its final edition. Long lines in Hong Kong to buy a last copy, not enough to protect freedom of speech. They don't want any newspaper to be holding them accountable. The arrest is the latest move in a battle between Beijing and Hong Kong democracy activists. After mass protests, Beijing imposed a national security law last June. In August, the US imposed sanctions on current and former officials, but outside pressure has had little impact. That same month, the owner of Apple Daily, tycoon Jimmy Lai, was arrested. And in January, more than 50 democracy activists were held under the national security law. Many have been jailed for opposing China's rule. Then in March, China approved changes to the electoral system, further diminishing democracy in Hong Kong. This month, another pro-democracy newspaper has scrubbed its opinion section. China's authoritarian president now determining Hong Kong's future with an iron fist. And Alison, the Hong Kong Journalist Association is accusing the police there of wanton arrest. The crucial question, will statements like this from President Biden and sanctions really be enough to confront China over democracy? Alison? Just when you thought the lockdowns were over, several Asian and Pacific countries bringing back their COVID restrictions, Australia, Malaysia, Hong Kong and Bangladesh trying to stop the spread of the dangerous Delta variant. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer has the latest. Allison, from Australia to Malaysia to Japan, this Delta variant is causing concern across Asia with new lockdowns. In cities like Sydney, there are restrictions that have been reimposed and stay-at-home orders in order to slow the spread of this variant, which we know is more contagious. There are four major cities across Australia that are now in lockdown. In Malaysia and in India, governments have reimposed restrictions there. Hong Kong has banned and flights arriving from the UK. In Bangladesh, there are soldiers patrolling the streets in order to enforce the stay at home orders. Uh, the problem or the challenge in a lot of places across Asia is vaccine campaigns. It's the lack of vaccinations. In some cases, there are supply issues. In other places, it's been the delivery system. But across the board, from the perspective of Asia, it's disappointing. This is a region that had weathered the pandemic and and now it's watching other countries around the world opening up. Uh, the vaccine rates, though, are comparatively low. You take Australia, for example, less than 5% of the country's population has been fully vaccinated. And so with less than a month to go to the Olympics in Tokyo, Japan is also seeing uh, a rise in COVID cases. There were 317 that were reported yesterday. It's the ninth week over week increase. And that is prompting fears that this Delta variant is going to trigger a fifth wave of infections in Japan. Um, it means that there's a very good chance that a lot of the restrictions and quarantines will remain in place for when the games get underway on July 23rd. The minister in charge has said if there's another state of emergency that's needed, then so be it. Already, there were two members of the Ugandan team that have tested positive with thousands of athletes and officials set to descend on the city. The Biden administration backing a new approach with drug users, harm reduction. So what does that mean? Well, Congress is funding things like clean syringe programs to keep drug users safe and just instead of just trying to get them clean. And you're looking right here at the reason why. Overdose deaths up nearly 30 percent from November 2019 to November 2020, according to preliminary federal data from the CDC. 
New York Times domestic policy editor Gabby Goodenough joins me now. Uh, uh, Gabby, in your reporting on harm reduction, Abby, rather, uh, you write, instead of helping drug users achieve abstinence, the chief goal here is to reduce their risk of dying or acquiring infectious diseases like HIV by giving them sterile equipment, tools to check their drugs for fentanyl and other lethal substances, or even just a safe space to nap. Uh, this is the first time Congress has given funds specifically for programs like this. Could you tell us more about the shift from both Congress and the Biden administration? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that they're looking at the huge increase in deaths over the past year, which um, clearly stem in part from the pandemic and all the isolation, the loss of access to treatment, et cetera. But also this was a trend that was rising even before the pandemic. And, you know, we've done a lot. We've pulled a lot of money into treatment and we'll keep doing that. But not everybody is going to want treatment or have access to it. So the Biden people are just starting to focus on what we can do to prevent deaths rather than to get everybody into treatment. Harm reduction policies are pretty controversial. Critics say they enable drug use or cause an increase in crime. So what do addiction researchers say about them? They say that neither of those things is true. And that, in fact, it, it's proven to reduce crime. Um, they don't, you know, one of the complaints is there's a lot more litter from uh, discarded needles in neighborhoods. Um, but, but what the researchers really say is it's really proven the, these techniques to reduce not just overdose deaths, but the spread of infectious disease. We're seeing big outbreaks of HIV now in West Virginia. We're seeing an outbreak even in Boston. We're seeing, um, you know, different little clusters around the country. And, and also we're seeing a lot of hepatitis C around the country from intravenous drug use and the sharing of needles. So the idea is, well, it's great to be working on getting as many people into treatment as we can. It's also great to try to halt the spread of infectious disease and especially of overdose deaths with these techniques. Um, and, and yeah, the research so says that. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. I was just going to say the research finds that it really does uh, prevent not only death, but the spread of infectious disease. You spoke with the executive director, I understand, of a harm reduction clinic in North Carolina about overdoses during the pandemic. Uh, aside from naloxone, she's advocating for another life-saving tool, drug checking programs. Could you tell us about those? What does that mean? Yeah, this is even a step more controversial than uh, syringe exchanges and fentanyl test strips because it's actually... Um, it's, it's these spectrometer machines that you can use to actually test samples of drugs. It's kind of a legal gray area right now in the United States because you have to possess the drugs in order to be able to test them, and possessing drugs is not legal, um, at least in most places and in most amounts. But the idea is if you can actually test your, the drugs you're about to use and see how much fentanyl they contain or whether they contain some other dangerous additive that might... Uh, kill you or land you in the hospital, um, it, it's worth it. It's going to save lives. So the hope is that we will take a cue from what some other countries are doing. New Zealand just uh, legalized this on a pilot basis for at least a year, I believe, um, and said they wouldn't prosecute anybody who, who checks drugs. Um, and I, I think it's just sort of the next step on the horizon toward making sure that yeah. people stop dying. Yeah, Abby, you said it's a legal gray area, but if the bottom line is to keep people alive, right, these are certainly programs, ideas, controversial as they may be, worth considering uh, to try to save lives. Thanks so much for coming yeah. on to talk to us about your reporting. Thanks so much. Take care. Should student athletes be able to profit off their own name, image and likeness? For the first time, an NCAA panel is saying yes. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk shows us what this could mean for college athletes. A potential slam dunk off the court for college athletes, hoping to earn money from their fame. The Division I Council recommending an interim policy to the NCAA's board of directors that would allow student athletes to profit from their own names, images, and likenesses. With the NCAA's Board of Governors set to meet tomorrow, the council's recommendation comes ahead of a flurry of state measures that will take effect Thursday, allowing athletes in places like Alabama, Florida, and Texas to profit. I think name, image, and likeness could help equalize opportunities for athletes, both men and women. 
Experts say star players aren't the only ones who would benefit. College athletes across the country will be able to sign endorsement deals. They'll be able to be paid to sponsor camps. They'll be able to be paid by going on social media and having a big following. And there is momentum on the athlete's side. Last week's unanimous Supreme Court decision upheld a ruling that the NCAA can't block educational benefits like paid internships and computers for college athletes. In his opinion, Justice Brett Kavanaugh slammed the NCAA for thinking it's above antitrust laws, writing in part, the labels cannot disguise the reality. The NCAA's business model would be flatly illegal in almost any other industry in America. For me, the next point is just educating myself on, on what comes out, what the NCAA decides to do. Graham Mertz, the quarterback for the University of Wisconsin, took to Twitter Monday, unveiling his own logo. He says his focus remains on the field while developing as a person off it. See, it's a great opportunity to grow and to, to grow your brand, but it's also how can you not let that take away from the team goal of winning games. I support my sister, Jamie Lynn Spears, talking about her sister's controversial conservatorship. NBC News correspondent Erin McLaughlin has more. I'm not my family. I'm my own person. I'm speaking for myself. Jamie Lynn Spears, once always by her superstar sister's side, now reemerging in her defense in an emotional Instagram video. If ending the conservatorship, if flying to Mars or whatever the hell else she wants to do to be happy, I support that 100 percent. Jamie Lynn addressing her sister's conservatorship head on, saying she's completely behind what Brittany wants. I don't care if she wants to run away to rainforest and have a zillion babies in the middle of nowhere. I am only her sister who's only concerned about her happiness. In a dramatic hearing last week, Brittany begged a judge to end the court-ordered conservatorship, an arrangement that's given her father, Jamie Spears, and other conservators control of her affairs since 2008, following two involuntary psychiatric holds and a very public breakdown. Brittany calling the conservatorship abusive, alleging she was forced to perform, take medication, and attend therapy against her will, saying conservators won't let her get married or have more children, even preventing her from removing an IUD. Her father's attorney telling the court, Mr. Spears is sorry to see his daughter suffering and in so much pain. Brittany's account prompting an explosion of support for Spears and criticism of her family, including an online petition asking Netflix to remove Jamie Lynn from an upcoming project for her alleged role in the dehumanizing conservatorship of her sister, Brittany Spears. Jamie Lynn, who starred in the teen sitcom Zoe 101, firing back. But I can assure you that I've supported my sister long before there was a hashtag, and I'll support her long after. Fellow pop star Christina Aguilera also offering support to Brittany, posting a photo of the Paris children. Aguilera writing, It is unacceptable that any woman or human wanting to be control of their own destiny might not be allowed to live life as they wish. My heart goes out to Brittany. She deserves all the true love and support in the world. Brittany and her boyfriend spotted on vacation in Hawaii after the hearing. The singer using her own Instagram to apologize to fans for holding back in the past, writing, I apologize for pretending like I've been okay the past two years. I did it because of my pride, and I was embarrassed to share what happened to me. He calls himself the luckiest guy in the world, a California snorkeler bit by a great white shark. And he walked out of the hospital on the same day. Insane, right? NBC News correspondent Morgan Radford has his story. Kind of felt like kind of almost like a mosquito, like a sharp, uh, you know, like a pain and like slight push. And then basically I quickly kind of wrapped my uh, leg and I could see like uh, face of the shark. 38 year old snorkeler Nemanja Spasievich opening up about his face to face encounter with a shark. At that point, I was like, okay, like I, I got hit. It happened Saturday in the waters south of San Francisco. Spasievich says he was swimming for crabs when the shark made contact. It felt like a very kind of like curiosity kind of uh, bite. I got like a 10 puncture wounds from the shark teeth and like they're in kind of two rows of. Spasievich started frantically kicking towards shore, saying the shark, which was no bigger than a dolphin, had no interest in pursuing him further. There was no kind of return attack or like kind of like coming back to me, but I wasn't looking uh, 
Uh, back. The low surf helped him get back to land, but he wasn't in the clear. I could see like my spat suit, like already was kind of uh, in the sleeve, like filled with blood. And I was like, yeah, like this is not good. Using his scuba gear, Spasievich quickly improvised a tourniquet around his leg and started looking up and down the beach for any sign of help. Basically, like, uh, I spotted the fisherman and yelled, help, shark, help, shark. I remember saying, it's life or death. You need to send someone soon. Emergency crews ultimately arriving, treating him with advanced life support measures before rushing him to a trauma center. I was asking, hey, is my leg going to be kind of good? Like, they were saying, yeah, like, you're going to keep the leg. So I was like, okay, like, I'm going to have a leg. I'm going to live. Like, what, what else I can ask for, you know? Like, an unforgettable experience, but not one, Spasievich says, that'll keep him away from the water. Uh, I think, like, sharks are not the bad guys. It's their kind of home. We are just visitors, and, you know, like, I'm going to visit again for sure. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.